Thanks for stopping by Big Top Gaming. My name is Brian, and in this video, we're going to go over the 2023 rules update for A Song of Ice and Fire, the miniatures game. Now, I think Cool Mini or Not officially refers to this as the 2021.2 or 0.02 update, something like that, or 2021, sorry, it's like a couple of years in the past, but I'm just going to go for 2023 update because it makes more sense. Um, now, for this video, I need to break it up into two because of my technical process. Um, my computer's like plagued with STLs that I need to put somewhere else so it can only process so much of a video at once. But also, the update is fairly, it's large enough to where if I want to comment on some of the implications of some of these changes, I didn't want one video to drag out for like two hours or something. So for this first part one video, or for this part one video, um, we're going to do Starks, Lannisters, Neutrals, and Night's Watch, and then part two would be the rest. So we'd have like Free Folk, Baratheon, the one Martell change, Greyjoys, and Targaryens. So the first change we come up for House come up against for House Stark is going to be the change to Brendan Tully, the Vanguard Infiltrator. Now he got the outflank change, which for the rest of these videos I'm just going to really refer to it as the outflank change and maybe touch on some small points in the factions themselves. But everything in the game with outflank changed to this. Um, so outside of that, Brendan Tully is a two point cavalry attachment, and he brings the order mark target which hasn't changed at all. That's always been there, but not many people probably pay attention to it because outflank was just so bad per before uh, before this change. So the change to outflank is that you may hold this unit off the table or in reserve instead of deploying it. At the start of any round, if you are not the first player, you may place one unit from reserve fully within short range of a friendly or flank table edge unactivated. So the cool thing about the change to un outflank here, unflank, outflank here is that previously you had to claim the maneuver position on the tactics board so and replace the tactic zone ability with being able to bring a unit in from outflank uh, there was a lot of interactivity from your opponent to be able to stop that they could also time it so that you could on your off turns where you really didn't where when you weren't the first player your opponent could block you out of that so you wouldn't be able to get that unit specifically when you wanted it and it could only come in on a flank edge. It couldn't come in on a ta on your friendly table edge at all. But now I think outflank is quite a valuable rule. I don't think it's overpowered because you can't do it as the first player. So you can't like kind of pull the rug out from under your opponent and charge something that they didn't really have the moment to react to, or maybe they forgot you even had anything that had outflank. And I think that's really going to be a a problem in quotes going into the future is people are just going to kind of forget that an outflank unit is off the table and they might feel like they're really gaining a lot of momentum in that mid game and then you bring a unit in from outflank and then you can totally just you know be caught off guard if you're not paying attention to these things overall i think brendan tully himself has become a pretty decent pick for some of the cheaper uh infantry or inf infantry or some of the cheaper cavalry units out there i don't know if i would want to slap him into a unit of tully cavaliers i mean 10 points to throw them off to the table that they wouldn't be coming in until like round two or three at the best uh I guess you could bring them in on turn one if you really wanted to, um, and you weren't going first. So I, I think that maybe there might be some play there if you can run, run some cheaper units and then supplement with having this bigger unit off the table. Um, an, amp, an outflanking uh, mark target is pretty interesting, and I think that Brendan Tully actually becomes a little bit more of a, a discussable pick in stark list so i'm looking forward to seeing him coming on the table a little bit more because i think he'll probably get some play so the next change for house stark's attachments is going to be for the mormont veteran she got the hardened change so everything in the game with hardened got this update uh, the new ability states each time an enemy's performing an attack on this unit after rolling defense dice this unit blocks one hit plus one hit for each one of its destroyed ranks the previous iteration of Harden just had one minor change uh, from what we're at now with this update, and that was the uh, unit could block plus one hit and then an additional hit for each one of its destroyed ranks. And uh, that just proved to be a little too survivable. Uh, hardened, since you're able to blo automatically block those hits after you've rolled defense dice, when you're just blocking an additional hit for 
for free, like bare minimum, even if you're full ranks, you're blocking a hit, it gets very difficult to take down a unit. And as the game attritions to run a unit down, it gets a lot more difficult to remove them when they're auto blocking two or even three hits. Thinking about something like House Umber Berserkers with a Mormont veteran on them meant that they were swinging at a massive potential of of hits. They throw a bucket of dice, and they're very dangerous hits that are very accurate. And then with that Mormont veteran on them, they're automatically blocking three hits when they're on their last rank, and they have like their normal defense save otherwise. So uh, that's just like I know it's probably not the greatest example in the universe of how Hardened gets used to the max, but uh, it's it just got very. Harden just got too reliable at keeping a unit around for the whole game, and you really couldn't get them off of the table. And if you had bonuses for having missing ranks uh, in addition to Hardened, they were just really difficult to get rid of. I don't know if having only Hardened on the on the Mormont veteran means that it's going to actually see table play, really. Uh, I really don't appreciate when a unit needs to have something happen to it in order for it to... I guess I don't care if a unit has that, but if an attachment needs to have certain conditions met before its points start actually affecting the game, I don't know if I like that. They probably could have given her at least one other thing, uh, just a small something, I don't know, to allow the unit to get some value out of it right away i would have appreciated it um it just feels like she needed a little bit more but i do like the hardened change because uh keeping a tanky unit around till the end of the game it just wasn't a good place to be so the next change for house stark is another game-wide change this is going to be to the house mormont she bears and they altered the war cry ability it's still an order that triggers at the start of a friendly turn the unit performs one morale test, and on a success, target one enemy in long range, it becomes panicked or vulnerable. So the big change here is that you have to pick between panicked or vulnerable. You no longer stack panicked and vulnerable. Uh, this is an interesting change, I guess, because it gives you like a variable mark the target with a uh, stipulation of having to pass that morale test. So Warcry previously I felt like was you needed to have Warcry in every single list you could build if you had the if you had access to it. It stopped me from playing Tormund as a commander because his attachment version had Warcry. I was typically spending a ton of points for one one so I could get Warcry into a free folk list. And some of my Stark lists that I'd been playing recently were doubling up on She Bears so I could get multiple instances of Warcry. And we all know that Asha was almost an auto-include in every Greyjoy list that you had built because of Warcry. So I don't know how much the dynamic on including Warcry in your lists is going to change. I still think that most armies, most were getting use out of Panic or Vulnerable. They were kind of leaning into one or the other. And mostly it was going to be vulnerable and then the panicked was just like an extra way to fish for some wounds if you if your opponent rolled like the right stuff to make it so that you could try and go for something like that you know of course like house Greyjoy probably uses both versions of those a little bit better because they're a very a combat focused army and they really can crank the panic if you really wanted them to i think house lannister probably could get value out of both sides of those but in but I, I'll be interested to see what happens with the the meta in quotes in general uh, as war cry as the, the war cry meta kind of shifts a little bit. I don't think that it takes it out of my list. I don't know if I would double down on she bears anymore unless I were in like a mage list specifically and really wanted to play fluffy Mormont stuff. But I think that war cry is still valuable. You're getting use out of panicked or vulnerable, and tokens are still really important considering that the lethality of the game. At least they want to claim the lethality of the game's gone down over the years, but I think that trying to push wounds through vulnerable is still really important to the game, so I don't think you're going to see many changes to people taking Warcry out of their lists. The next change for House Stark is that the House Mormont Bruisers are dropping from 7 to 6 points. So up on the screen here, I've got the image of the House Mormont Bruisers, and I know that I have a video discussing this unit. I did really like them when they came out. I did, I do believe, if I recall correctly, that in my video I said they don't quite feel like a 7-point unit, like they're almost, almost there, but not quite. This is like one of those six and a half point units if you really want to coin that um 
so going down to six points, I think this unit becomes much more attractive in a House Stark list. You the the House Mormont Bruisers aren't the most survivable unit in the universe, but that doesn't really matter so much when you have something like Counter Strike and then all of the Stark cards that end up giving you benefits for kind of having lower amounts of ranks. It's a weird balance that you have to do to keep this unit hanging around. Um, but I do think that the House Mormont Bruisers become much more attractive at six points, and I know that I will. Previously, I, I do have a mage list that I really enjoy playing, and it the first iteration of it had House Mormont Bruisers in it, but I had removed them because the seven points was just not really jiving well with some of the other things that I wanted to bring. But now that they're six points for this type of profile, like they're very aggressive and very specialized and just they have a lot of bells and whistles, they feel like they're extremely valuable for that point level that they're coming in at. And I think a lot of people should try and, or if you're a House Stark player, you should try and get these on the table at six points. I feel like they're really great at that, at that point level. And we're getting to the, the, we're getting it at six points. You don't feel bad for putting an attachment in that unit at seven. It was really hard to do, but now you can start putting attachments in there to make these guys a lot more valuable. So I'm really happy to see these guys come down. Our next unit change for House Stark is going to be the House Karstark Spearman. Uh, the House Karstark Spearman had the Bulwark Formation ability removed and ended up getting it replaced with the Order Hold the Line. So the Karstark Spearman had come in the, the redesigned starter for House Stark. And the Bulwark Formation, like, I, I don't know, the House Karstark stuff is in an interesting space in the Stark army in general, since the synergies really aren't extremely uh, apparent. I guess I shouldn't even say apparent. They, they're, they're like the, they're like the salty, they're like the, the salt that goes into like caramel or something. So like if House Stark is caramel, these guys are the salt. They're supposed to give it that contrast of survivability to like, uh, that use, using your own bodies as resources type business or just trying to attrition down to get more use as you start losing dudes. But uh, car Stark stuff seems to be much more survivable. So Bulwark Formation used to be, if this unit hasn't performed an action this round, it gains plus two to its defense dice rolls. So it would go to a two plus defense save. And I don't think that was really an attractive... Uh, like ability for Stark players. I thought that it had some interesting play, especially with these guys uh, coming in at the point level that they were coming in at. I mean, uh, I guess six points probably. If they were five with that ability, maybe it would be a little bit more attractive. Six was a little rough, but now I think they're kind of where they want to be because hold the line is an order that triggers uh, when the unit activates, you can target one enemy engaged with this unit, and it suffers two hits plus one hit for each of this unit's remaining ranks. So again, I I don't I think there just might be some some strange design with Car Stark in the Stark army in general because this unit wants to have a lot more remaining ranks, and Starks aren't extremely well known for making sure that their units can have a lot of wounds within them. They have to dig into like. The neutrals to start doing this stuff but uh the these guys will sustain for a while they hit on fours they've got that seven seven four attack stat they still have stand your ground so your opponent can't take like uh charge flank or rear bonuses against them but i'm, I'm just not 100 convinced this kind of fixes the car star experiment gets them into a better place but i'd be interested to see what other people think of this unit or car stark stuff in general because like it just doesn't jive with me in the way that i've just in the way that i've taught myself how to play starks now and uh, it just is weird so better than what it used to be i still don't know if it's amazing but i'm willing to put it on the table and see how i feel about it i just need to play a car stark army once and just see how it goes because i just don't seem to have enough respect for these units but let me know in the comments what you think about this because i'm really interested to see how people are utilizing these so the final unit change we have for house stark is going to be coming in for the stark bowman and it's a simple change they had their uh, morale improved from seven plus to six plus and i'm pretty good with this they were really or they are really uh paper they have that six plus defense save and a six plus morale now so at least they're not 
they're a little bit better than average when it comes to passing those morale checks. But it, with having seven just put you in this point where if your opponent was targeting down that unit with uh, like a crown zap or any kind of panic test, it was really easy for these guys to go down. Now, the, the difference between seven and six isn't that amazing, but at least gets it to a point where if you're at minus one on these panic tests, you're at least likely to pass those most of the time if you believe in averages. Uh, and probability. I guess you can believe in averages, but probability is another thing that's different with dice. It's weird. But anyways, um, I really like these guys as bunkers for a lot of my backfield commanders. Like this is almost, I have like Roderick stapled to this unit. I might as well glue him down into their base as much as I put him in there. But this means that I'm not so uh, I don't have to worry about being too risky by putting my commander in a seven point or a seven morale unit. Um, now I think they're at least just a little bit more survivable, which they were good before, and now they're just a little bit better. So I don't know if uh, if people have like kind of left these guys behind, but I do think that they're definitely worth playing with, and I'm happy with this change. The final change is to a tactics card, and now I think they tried to say that they didn't change many tactics cards where they didn't need to, um, but this one did need to change. It's just simply Brendan Tully, the Blackfish's War Cry. He did get the War Cry change to where it's just a unit becomes panicked or vulnerable. Now, I think this could have been a really great opportunity for Cool Mini or Not to take these cards that are abilities like War Cry and turn them into something else and just say that war cry the tactics card version you could call it like battle scream or something i don't care what you call it but uh this commander card since they're so finite in their use except for like people who can bring them back like sansa or something but being able to do panicked and vulnerable on a tactics card wouldn't be really all that big of a deal when you put it on a unit that can do it every single turn and sometimes multiple or, or i'm sorry every every single round and sometimes multiple times around with like issue commands or something i think that's where it became a real problem as a tactics card i can be perfectly fine with having a unit get panicked and vulnerable like two maybe three times a game and then not stack that with like she bears or something but uh that's just a just my opinion on this otherwise i don't really have a whole lot of like i don't have a whole lot to say about it in this one because uh you're really not leaning into the panic game with starks most of the time so you're going to be throwing vulnerable and i'm fine with it it still feels like this is kind of a bummy tactics card uh there just really could have been an opportunity here to do something really interesting instead of recycling an ability that got nerfed and then on a tactics card they're so much more valuable but i think i kind of have stood on the soapbox of this enough uh it's it's a change and you know brendan tully's still an interesting commander with this so it's not he doesn't feel the impact so much as some others Switching over now to the Lannisters, the first change we come across is to Adam Marbrand, Commander of the City Watch, and he just simply got the Harden change, which I don't think is a super huge deal for them because Lannisters typically have uh, a few more defensive units that you're taking, so it, it's not. I don't feel like this is the most impactful change in the universe for him. It does slow down his survivability in his unit a little bit, so he can't be in an extremely risky unit, like something with like a 5-up defense save, but I don't. I, I just don't feel like it's ma massively impactful for him for the game. Next up on the list, we have Adam Marbrand, Trusted Bannerman. Now, this is uh, Adam's attachment version. They made changes to Vassal and removed the Jamie's Protector ability and replaced it with Sentinel. So, previously, the, Jamie, or the Vassal rule was that you would count as your named commander when the unit's targeted by tactics cards. Now, the vassal rule says, well, his is Jamie's vassal specifically, so he does call out Jamie Lannister in, in particular, but just states that this model counts as Jamie Lannister for her, all abilities and effects. So that includes tactics cards, any orders that might mention commanders specifically. And I don't have a photographic knowledge of the game to the point where I can pick out exactly where every single one of these instances of abilities and effects starts to be really effective over just tactics cards but i imagine if there isn't any if there isn't much now i imagine there will be more in the future as things kind of progress the replacement of jamie's protector with uh sentinel is interesting because the new wording on the jamie's vassal 
would have made it. So if Adam Marbrand kept Jamie's protector, he could trigger Jamie's protector if someone attacked his own unit. So someone would swing and then he'd get to swing back. So now he just has a, has it as an order where um, when another friendly unit's in long range is attack, he can pour, his unit can perform a charge or maneuver action. So he doesn't get the auto attacks anymore if there's, you know, if there's like a dual engagement situation going on. I think it's not like the biggest downgrade in the universe. It's just kind of like a, a side grade thing maybe. But um, specifically the way they've reworded uh, the vassal rule, the Jamie's protector just couldn't exist on Adam Marbrand. I think he'd be too good at that point. So um, overall, I think it's not the worst change in the universe for him. Um, it's definitely not a, a nerf or a buff or anything like that. Um, I mean, it, being able to sentinel against any unit as opposed to only when Jamie was being attacked, because there's a lot of reasons why someone wouldn't want to attack Jamie's unit. So I think this actually probably is more of a buff than anything on him. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, Adam Marbrand and both his attachment and commander form are still very viable and good. The next change for Lannisters is going to be for the Champion of the Faith. They just got the War Cry change, and this is the War Cry change that I think is going to be the most uh, hard felt. Um, with Lannisters being able to synergize so much with the Boltons, and Boltons playing so much into Panic, and then the Lannisters not really having an amazing amount of offensive output, like it's just not their shtick. They, they have units that can do it, but it's not really their main focus. So being able to vulnerable and panic something was really helpful for them in being able to punch through the armor with your less effective combat units and then get to that panic check uh, so that you then are panicked and can maximize your shenanigans there was really good. But I still think the Champion of the Faith is decent for the list. I don't know how many people are going to be like packing two of these in their list anymore, but you can. I definitely think he'll still have places in Lannister list. It's just that he's not got the the double whammy of being extremely impactful and synergistic for the army. So next up we have some of the first massive changes to a model in the Lannister army, and that's going to be the Clegane Butcher attach cavalry attachment. So the changes for this are dropping from 2 to 1 point, and then they removed the order spread fear, they removed weakened resolve, and added fueled by slaughter. So essentially a major redesign for this particular model. So the things with the Clegane Butcher beforehand, I don't know how many Lannister players were really utilizing this to the maximum, but with him, he was basically just a force multiplier for flayed men. You didn't really find a reason to put him onto Knights of Casterly Rock. You couldn't find many of much of a reason to put him onto the uh, the cavalry unit for uh, the Clegane Brigands. I don't know why I couldn't think of the name there for a second, but um, he wasn't really... You know, he didn't really synergize too much with them. I mean, the the brigands at least had had vicious, um, and it had some panic shenanigans there. But with them being as expensive as they as they are were, um, they uh, it just wasn't something that you saw with them, especially given their defensive stats. So just having the Clegane Butcher take the House Bolton Flayed Men up to ten points, uh, anything that the Bolton Flayed Men were getting into, they were likely to fail panic between vicious and intimidating presence and any other kind of stacked debuffs you might have gotten through some of the other th tools available to the Lannisters. And then having weakened resolve just meant that uh, getting into a fight with these guys was uh, quite grindy and hard to get out of because you're going to be regularly failing panic tests and then any other unit within long range was going to be also failing panic tests uh, solely because the... Uh, spread fear it was it's hard to clip through uh the house bolton flayed men so they would typically have their two ranks so you're sending out minus three uh panic tests and you know if that unit happened to be engaged it could get up to minus four so i i don't think that the clegane butcher was really like putting up the numbers so to speak in the competitive fashion at least i don't pay too much attention to like competitive lannister lists but in theory that's really all he was good for was just force multiplying fl flayed men now, for one point, he is a little bit easier to justify in some of these other units, and Fueled by Slaughter is pretty decent in a Lannister list where you're looking to try and, you, you can take advantage of some healing 
shenan or not shenanigans so much, but you have access to healing because you're going to be wanting to take the coin quite frequently with them and keeping it away from your opponent so you don't like upset that attrition advantage. But now fueled by slaughter for one point on him states, after this unit completes a melee attack, if the defender suffered any wounds, this unit restores one wound plus one additional wound for each of the defender's destroyed ranks. So it meant the more you leaned into something, or it means the more you lean into something, the more wounds you're going to be getting. I don't know if all of the cavalry units really appreciate this like knights of casterly rock uh they aren't they really aren't the unit that is uh in for the long haul in terms of uh long engagements given that you know the uh lance rule is really pivotal to making sure that they get through things they kind of want to pick on weaker targets and try and bulldoze through them they really don't want to be engaged for a long time so fueled by slaughter might not do the best for them but with the clegane brigands i think he actually fits in with them now given that they um have that lower defensive stat line and with only one point you're able to get a little bit more work done with them i think uh yeah with only one point for the attachment i think you're able to justify the existence in that unit a little more so overall i'm i'm happy that they just made the clegane butcher not just a a bolt-on for boltons huh um but uh but I'm interested to see where he goes from here, especially when you look at some of the other cavalry units like Hedge Knights and things like that. I don't know if he really makes a whole lot of sense in those, but um, overall, I think he's pro the Clegane Butcher is probably in a better place instead of just being you know focused in this one role. So the next card for change in the attachments is going to be Jamie Lannister Kingsguard. Uh, he did get a universal change, so there was an alteration to Expert Duelist. Uh, currently, well, I guess post errata the gist of it is that expert duelist goes off on a five plus now instead of a three plus so every time you ended up performing an attack with the melee unit before the rolling attack dice you either got to choose to have the attack deal plus one wound flat out or you could choose to target an infantry attachment in the defender's unit and then just roll a d6 and it used to be on a three plus you'd kill the character now it's been changed to a five plus it makes expert duelist less reliable which I'm not so sure if I really appreciate that. I think taking it from a 66% chance to a 33% chance to just kill the character, I think it's going to limit the um, the impact at least. Or, or It doesn't limit the impact of Expert Duelist. You're still able to do plus one wound all the time, which is extremely important when you're looking at trying to force panic tests on unit that might, units that might be a little bit more defensive. But changing the expert duelist to a five plus i think it still makes it so that when your opponent rolls that five it still really sucks but it's just not going to happen as frequently in theory when you're looking at um, how reliable it goes off so i don't know if there's a way to fix expert duelist beyond that because all they like i said all they did was make it so it's less likely to happen but it still hurts as much as it used to i just think that maybe now you might be able to see some people pulling away from the the variety of expert duelists where they're trying to get that five up to kill an attachment and they're just going to be utilizing it for the plus one wound or the plus one auto wound um and maybe just maybe that'll keep people from being extremely apprehensive about adding some of those more expensive attachments to their unit so i hope the intended outcome that cool mini or nots planned for this actually comes to fruition because i do think attachments add a lot of interesting dynamics to the game but expert duelist going off on a three plus was just way too reliable where it became really uh, it was a real big risk to even take attachments. You almost in a two-list pairing had to have one list that planned for Expert Duelist and the other one that didn't. Uh, so I think the change is fine. I just don't know if it's like really gonna really gonna do m much to try and limit the the impact or the the prevalence of Expert Duelist at least. The final change to attachments for the Lannister army or faction is going to be to joffrey baratheon first of his name so they removed the king is dead and then added orders of the crown so the king is dead was joffrey's like one of his main fallbacks for being taken like there's just there's a lot of benefit to what joffrey brings to the to the game into a lannister list i should say where the king's guard are extremely cheap for a really effective unit with all the banners they have and the stats and never losing any kind of attack potential 
they also uh, Joffrey's cards are also pretty impactful. They all come with their own drawbacks, but still they're very strong. The issue was that Joffrey's unit wants to be in the mix and doing a lot of work, but you're de-incentivized because if your opponent kills that unit, your opponent would gain two victory points just for just on top of everything else they would gain, and then every unit within, I think it was long range, maybe it's short range. Uh, no, it is long range. Every unit within long range would become panicked, and Lannisters aren't really like putting up the numbers for morale for the most part. But uh, so it made it so that if you were taking Joffrey Baratheon, you had to be extremely good at peace trading and pro- and understanding projected threat from your opponent, and also just hope that you didn't have some dice rolls not go your way. Now with that ability gone, which I guess makes sense because like I don't think anyone in the land in King's Landing actually really cares if he had died or not. And I'm pretty sure no one cared. So why give my opponent two victory points for it? But that's more fluff than thing game. But now they've replaced it with Orders of the Crown that states each time a friendly NCU claims the crown, you can replace that zone's effect with Joffrey Baratheon's unit performs one maneuver or march action. And I think this is huge for him. We saw this on Kevin Lannister, and I really appreciated it. It's it makes it gives the Lannisters some extra out, offensive output, and your opponent's not going to be wanting to take the crown most of the time. Like most opponents, just don't want this zone. Even if you're playing like a Baratheon list, where sometimes they get some benefits from taking the crown, they're still not going to be gunning for it. They're really going to be taking the zones that help their attrition game plan. So Lannisters are really the only ones who are like you know if you are trying to you know outmaneuver them by not getting a crown zap that has a bunch of negative buffs or negative debuffs on it. Uh, You're pretty likely going to have this zone available to you and being able to exchange something that might be a little less impactful. If you're not really leaning into the panic game by the crown zap, you can add some extra offensive output to Joffrey's unit by making that uh, maneuver or March. Um, I guess like you can't attack, but Uh, for whatever reason, I was just thinking you could with this card, but maybe I'm mistaken. Um, but you, you only get a maneuver march action. So at least you can get his unit a little further up the table and not have to worry if your opponent's trying to slow down your maneuverability with taking the, the, uh, maneuver position on the tactics board. So I think this is a good change overall. And I feel like people are going to see a lot more Joffrey Baratheon lists out there. Cause I know a lot of people really like the Kingsguard aesthetic and Joffrey is, he, all of his cards are super impactful, so I think he's going to become a power player in the uh, Lannister lists, or in the Lannister suite of lists. So now we can move into the unit changes for House Lannister, and the first one is going to be the Castry Rock Honor Guard. They dropped from 8 to 7 points, and their movement increased from 4 to 5, so this is nothing but good for them. I do have a video out there going over what I think about the Castry Rock Honor Guard when they first dropped. Um, I think that a lot of my... A lot of my opinions in on the Castrilly Rock Honor Guard were reflected with these changes. I felt like they were too expensive for what they did. Like they had a lot of tricky stuff, but being eight points and having a low move stat, and then having your effectiveness be contingent on getting out these tokens was really rough. And that was in a war cry world where you could get panicked and vulnerable on units quite easily. Now with uh with Warcry changing, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's tough for these guys to exist because um, I still think Weekend is a really amazing ability for them. So seeing them, you might see them pop up in a lot of like um, in a lot of uh, Tywin Lannister based lists because Weekend on them really does increase their offensive output and make sure they can be effective until the very last drop of the unit. Um, but also, Panicked and Vulnerable is still really easy to get out there. So I think that with the points dropped down to seven, they feel like a seven point unit. You know, they've got like a hitting on threes with a seven, six, five decay stat. And now with them being speed five instead of four, speed four is pretty miserable for a unit, especially infantry units that don't get those extra maneuvers. So I think that the Casterly Rock Honor Guard are going to be something you're going to start seeing on the table. And I'm looking forward to playing them myself. So the next unit change for house lannister is going to be to the house clegane brigands and i had kind of alluded to their change a little bit earlier with the clegane butcher but they simply dropped from seven to six points and i'm really happy with that change because i don't think many people respected this unit at seven points they definitely did a lot of work 
at seven points. Like they have vicious and your defender, the defender suffering an additional wound from failing panic tests for each of its destroyed ranks was really good for them. Like they get to that panic check and the more your opponents killed, the more damage they do. They just felt really good in terms of what that side of their card did. And then Brutal Armaments being a 7-5 attack stat that hits on threes and then being speed six, it gave Lannisters access to a really quick cavalry unit. And the problem was, is with them being a 5-7 stat, like 5 plus defense and 7 plus morale at seven points, you're spending a lot of points for a unit that probably isn't going to be able to survive much impact with your opponent. Like they can connect, but they might not be living much past that. But now with the Clegane Butcher, they can start fueling some of those wounds back. I think adding field for slaughter is worth the one point on them. But if you want to keep them cheap in like a mountain run list, like a house Clegane focus list, you're getting another Clegane unit to bounce off your cards. And they synergize really well with everything he wants to do. So I think that this really puts these guys into a uh, into the discussion in terms of being able to take them. Another uh, unit that I'm interested to see what the implications do for... Uh, seeing more like House Clegane based lists because I think he kind of fell off the radar a little bit. But I feel like that Clegane Brigands freeing up some more points for him is going to help that list out quite a bit. So the final unit change for House Lannister is the one that I feel is the most impactful for them, and that's going to be to the Lannister Halberdiers. They dropped from 6 to 5 points. So now they're at parity with the uh, Lannister Guard, and I don't like. I think the only thing that justifies them dropping in points is the fact that they hit on fours. Like set for charge meant that they got some extra attacks, but they're always sundering. They've got a six four stat or a four six stat, so four plus defense saves six plus morale, and they just they they are a very offensive defensive unit. I guess is what you could say. And now that they're five points, like when we we're talking about uh, the Clegane list before. Lannister halberdiers are something that I would easily put in that list. I have played Clegane-led lists where I have two of these, and now getting those extra points means I free up a lot of room in that list. But I think halberdiers are just really strong units. Um, at six points, maybe some people were having issues taking them because of their output at being a 4+, plus. but I really do think that this unit is putting up a lot of it, they're going to be valuable in, in Lannister lists. I think you're going to start seeing a lot more of them again, and I'm really happy to see that they change this way. Um, I'm just... The amount of point drops that came in the Lannister unit section is pretty in interesting, but I think they're... I don't really feel like there's anything much else that needed to change. The Lannisters feel pretty decent in general, but... Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what other Lannister players are doing with this because they, they definitely aren't like a faction in my main rotation. They're more of just a faction that I like to play every now and again. So interested to see what Lannister players have to say, but I think overall I'm pretty happy with their changes. So next up we've got the neutral changes, and the first one they end up coming up with is Brienne Maiden of Tarth. She got a universal change to Knightly Vow, and now after the update, Knightly Vow states... After deployment, target one enemy unit. When charging that enemy unit, this unit may reroll any charge distance dice. While you control the swords, this unit's melee attacks gain plus one to hit. And she also kept the stalwart rule, which didn't really change at all. So still at two points, but previously, Knightly Vow was really not... It, it, every single person that it was stapled to, it just wasn't worth much on, because it meant that the, 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 uh, the plus one to hit and charge distance were contingent only on the unit that you picked for Knightly Vow. So once you did your work to get rid of that unit, you were paying two points for Stalwart, and that was it. Now, at least, um, it's it's kind of interesting how Knightly Vow, Vow works now. You get to reroll your charge distance dice against the unit that you vowed against, but um, you're, it only really, in theory, should only work once unless your opponent's playing a more slippery unit. And now the plus one to hit, you have to have the swords to gain the plus one to hit. It doesn't happen automatically, even if you're attacking the unit that you're uh, that you have your knightly vow against. I think a better way to change this one would have been to find a way to word it so that um, the enemy unit that you pick for your knightly vow, you always get plus one to hit against them and always reroll your charge distance dice. I still feel like charge distance could get remove from this and have something different put on because really it only matters like like I said I feel like 
for the most part, it only matters once. But having to have the swords in order to get the plus one to hit, even against your knightly vow target, feels a little off to me. But overall, I think um, giving them a permanent buff, in quotes, as long as you've got the swords, you gain your plus one to hit regardless of what unit you're attacking, is an is an increase to the efficacy of Knightly Vow. I still don't think that it really, like, if I'm putting Knightly Vow into my list through Brienne of Tarth, or Maiden of Tarth, I'm going to be mostly putting her in there for the stalwart, and the rest is just, like, it's cool. I think Knightly Vow was more of a control where your opponent goes, and now since now since you need the swords to get that plus one to hit, I don't think that Knightly Vow is enough to really, like, scare someone away from getting or scare someone from deploying something away from Brienne a little bit. It's just not as scary anymore. So I really think Knightly Vow should be a little bit more impactful. I don't think this was the the right change for Knightly Vow, but it's definitely in going in a good direction and I would be nothing nothing would make me happier than to be surprised by being wrong by this, but um, we'll see where it goes. Next up for attachment changes comes to the Glory Seeker and he also got a universal change. Uh, Rally Cry is simply gone, and no, I don't. I believe no one in the game has access to Rally Cry anymore. But uh, they added Iron Resolve and added added Stubborn Tenacity. So still for one point, instead of getting Rally Cry, we get Iron Resolve. This unit gains plus one to Panic Test rolls and suffers Neg one wound from failing Panic Tests. Stubborn Tenacity also comes along with this and states that each time this unit passes a panic test you you target or the one one enemy they are engaged with suffers one wound so the glory seeker rally cry is just way too strong there are so many ways to get extra attacks out of units and in armies that didn't have real great access to healing i'm thinking like my targaryen lists like and this is just me having played them enough and having a winning enough record with them. The the cavalry attachments were immune to expert duelists. So I usually brought, brought two units that had glory seekers in them. And it was very difficult to remove any of my cavalry units off the table because I was charging often and attacking frequently. Especially in something like a Cal Drogo led list where you're just so offensive and so aggressive. And making sure that you can rally cry blood riders back to that unit... Rally Cry was just far too strong, and I'm perfectly fine with the idea of them getting rid of it from the game completely, because it really was just so... If you had access to Rally Cry somewhere, you had to have it. It was just so strong. There's no reason to not bring it. If you're bringing Rally Cry and not getting anything out of it, you, either your positioning sucks, or you're just steamrolling your opponent. So now with the Glory Seeker, I feel like... The Glory Seekers become a lot more pigeonholed into where it wants to go. Um, I think it's interesting to take some of the units, like if I, you know, just completely convert him over and say that the, my my Screamers are getting Glory Seekers of the update now, getting plus one to panic test rolls is cool, and then whenever they pass the panic, flicking a wound back at your opponent is neat, but I don't know if it's one point valuable when I have a lot of other things that I could take for that. I could see the Glory Seeker making his way into maybe some... Stark led lists that have cavalry hanging around. Um, with people wanting to, like, if you kind of have your your Tully Cavalier bubble out there, um, they already have a pretty decent morale stat. Giving them plus one to that and then flinging a wound back at your opponent every time they attack them is pretty neat. But they also don't want to stay engaged forever because they do have that lance rule. So I'm not sure if the Glory Seeker has kind of fallen off to the wayside into a world of like obscurity where maybe you might see him in some corner case spaces but I don't know if the glory seeker I think I just don't know if he's extremely valuable anymore stubborn tenacity and iron resolve together are really cool but I just don't know if they're going to be going into the right cavalry units again another thing I'd like to see me be wrong on but I do feel like my glory seekers have just kind of fallen off I might see myself actually taking fortune seekers more now to try and get some more of that offensive output but the glory seeker definitely got a massive change that was needed but I think the replacements for these might not be quite what I'm looking for out of them now changes to units are up for the neutrals, and we got the first one in the Golden Company crossbowmen. They simply dropped from 8 to 7 points. So it's I don't think there's a single person out there who thought that this unit was worth 8 points when they released. 
Uh, they just their defensive stats were pretty middling. Their offensive output is weird. They still have nothing on their card has changed. They still have the Sentinel Order. They still have Sundering and can re-roll attack dice when they're attacking enemies in short range, and they still have Iron Resolve. So this unit has an ability to protect them against panic, but they're not a unit that wants to be in combat. However, they have Sentinel, which allows them to charge, even though most people are going to be wanting to use it for the maneuver to get them into position for shooting. At 7 points with a 664 stat, hitting on 3s and only getting the rerolls when you're within short range of enemy units, I don't know if I really like this unit at 7 points. I think they might have needed a little bit of an overhaul. A Sentinel just feels really confusing here, and maybe some people out there are getting better use out of this than me. And I think maybe when we end up getting like a Golden Company Commander, things might change a little bit for them, but they still feel like a really uh, discombobulated unit. They've got a lot going on that seems to put them in... They, each, each one of these abilities focuses them in a different direction. Like Sentinel makes them feel like they're really aggressive. The Crossbow makes them feel a little bit more standoffish, but they do want to be in short range. And then Iron Resolve is supposed to protect them from engagements because their 5-plus defense save sure isn't. So uh, I'm interested to see how this drop in points changes them. I really don't know. I feel like if they were 6 points, they'd be extremely con worth considering, because then I wouldn't care about whatever half the other card does. At 6 points, an effective shooting unit is pretty strong. But at 7 points, it feels like they really want to be doing what they're doing really well, and I just don't know if they quite hit the mark on that one. So again, another thing I'm really happy to be proven wrong on, but right now I'm, I'm a little bit on the, on the off side on these guys. The next unit change comes to the House Bolton Flademen, and they simply just had their attack dice dropped on their first rank from 7 to 6. So now they have a 6-4 attack stat, but that's the only th real thing that's changed on them. I think the House Bolton Flayed Men have just been one of those things, since anyone can take them, and they do what they do so well. As soon as you got into an army that utilized panic manipulation, they just became standout stars at throwing 7 dice right away is quite a bit of damage to do when you're hitting on threes. Now with six, uh, it's not so bad, especially if they're staying engaged. I think that's what this really means to do is like lower their effectiveness if they can't get out of engagement because they're not getting critical blow when they stay engaged. And six dice hitting on threes means that you're really only connecting with four on average. If you're weakened, you're probably connecting with two or three. So I think the change to House Bolton Flayed Men doesn't lower their presence in the game. It's just a small tweak down because I feel like the cool men you're not developers and designers feel like House Bolton Flayed Men are kind of in a good spot to where you're not going to be seeing those like old Flayed Men for, for Flayed Men lists. But um, I think they wanted to kind of knock them down a tad without completely invalidating them. So I think they're, I think this is a fine change. I don't hate it. I'm sure a lot of people who play a lot of them are going to feel it and really complain about it. But I think that Flayed Men are still just really good. And this is not the most impactful change in the universe. Our final change comes to Peter Baelish uh, as an NCU. I think this is our first NCU change we've had so far. But uh, the change... A master of the game, his only ability is got a massive change. So Peter Baelish starts the game with three order tokens. Each time Peter claims a zone, you may spend one order token to replace its effect with the effect of any unclaimed zone. Once per game, at the start of any turn, you may select one zone. Until the end of that round, you count as controlling that zone. So the real change here is just that Peter Baelish used to always be able to... Um, use replace the effect of the zone you claim with any other unclaimed zone and you didn't have to remove order tokens from it uh, maybe the designers felt like this was a little too strong and that he could always just kind of do what he wanted to i think three order tokens is a little rough for him uh i don't maybe they felt like it was a five point ability and they didn't want to increase him to five points to just really screw up the uh neutral game so that by putting order tokens on them, they could keep him in the four-point zone. But I think, uh, and this is maybe I'm being a little, uh, a little like 
over the top here, but I think if you're going to do something like limit Peter Baelish as master of the game to three times per game with the order tokens, he should not be able to have the, he shouldn't have the stipulation that says he needs to do it with an unclaimed zone. He should be able to take the effect of any zone on the tactics board if you're going to be limiting it to three tokens, and then I would have felt really good about the change, because then you're limiting what he can do with a once per game deal, and then the three order tokens, and then you're making it so that the first part of Master of the Game is extremely impactful. It's not to say that you won't see Peter Baelish in the lists that he was already being taken in, because he still do does what he did previously, just like two or three times less a game. So uh, I'm very intrigued by why, by the change. I think if there's... I'd, I'd be interested to hear their justification for why they decided to do this. I think a lot of it has to do with, like, they them feeling master of the game was a five-point ability on a four-point NCU, and they didn't want to take another point punch at, at neutrals here. But, um, again, I think they could have done this a little bit more um, uh, delicately and make his impact feel a little bit more interesting. Right now, I just don't know if he, like feels like the power player he's supposed to be. Now, I definitely don't ride the mope train very much when it comes to some of these changes, but overall, I feel like neutrals didn't really quite... They got a lot taken away from them, and the changes that are supposed to be buffs to things that they've got feel a little confusing between the Knightly Vow and the Golden Company in general. Like, Golden Company's existence is just strange in general to me. But um, I think there this really does exacerbate the idea that I have that neutrals really need a good hard look at because constantly neutrals are getting punished for the sins of other factions and it's very difficult for them to really gain a foothold within their own faction because if you take a look at something like Golden Company Crossbowmen it would really suck to be able to give like Lannisters or Night's Watch or anyone else a six point reliable crossbow unit but in neutrals it's probably not going to be that impactful because they don't have the same type of synergies or things that they lean into. I honestly think if they just put an across-the-board thing, like made all of the NCUs in neutrals quite powerful, bumped them all up a point, like increase points on every unit and every NCU, but then have an overarching neutral rule that says if you're playing a neutral-led faction, if your commander is neutral, all of your neutral units cost one less. And I think that might get a little funky if you're doing something like leading a Lannister list with with Bruce Bolton or something, but I don't think it would be that big of a deal. Like, if you said, you know, Flayed Men were now nine points instead of eight, but whenever you play a commander that's neutral, you get them for eight points again. I think that would bring a lot of interest to the neutral faction and make them feel a lot more impactful than just being kind of like the screw around faction. Now, like I said, I don't try to get mopey all that much, but I really feel like neutrals need a good once over. Like they really need to focus in on them because right now with their limited access to commanders and the way things release for them, they feel really discombobulated and it seems difficult to play neutrals as a faction in general. So that's just kind of, I feel like that's my soapbox for the video that I'd get on. And I hope that that doesn't fall on deaf ears or there's something that like maybe gets done to try and change these things, but I really do feel like neutrals kind of get stuck in the gutter, and I would really like to see them get elevated, but a lot of these changes don't really seem to do that for them. So I know at the start of the video I said I was going to do Night's Watch in here as well, but we're already almost at an hour, and Night's Watch got a significant amount of changes, so I think what I'm going to have to do here is do three parts to this series, and then Night's Watch and Free Folk are going to be in their own video because they both got a massive amount of changes, and uh, that's just going to take a, w a bit to go through. So I hope you're enjoying the series here. I think it gives players an opportunity to kind of see the changes from another perspective if they're not a player of that faction and especially if they haven't seen those units on the table before like Casterly Rock Honor Guard or something like that. So uh, let me know what you think about these in the comment section below and what kind of changes you would have liked to maybe see in your faction or which ones you're most excited about for your faction. Um, outside of that, uh, thanks for sticking with me through this one. I know it's a doozy but there's a lot to go through here so I look forward to seeing you in the next couple videos here.